You can probably tell what kind of a little boy I was by the verse that was often quoted to me was the last half of Proverbs 13, 15, which says, but the way of transgressors is hard. Uh, the phrase is translated differently in others. A new international version says, but the way of the unfaithful leads to their destruction. A new living translation, a treacherous person is headed for destruction. Or the English standard version, but the way of the treacherous is their ruin. Uh, the word translated transgressors in the King James is bagad, and it has this picture of to cover with a garment, this idea of acting covertly, dealing deceitfully. So it's not simply transgressing, it's being treacherous in the process. You know, I grew up in a very idyllic situation. We played outside, our mothers never worried about us. I was allowed to ride my bike over to my grandparents' house on the other side of the city. We didn't know about drunkenness in the area or violence. It was a very different world to grow up in. And so how the Lord taught me this lesson, you know, sometimes we hear it said that the way of the believer is hard. Well, yes, hard, but not in this sense, not in the sense of being headed to destruction or to ruin as these words are translated. The idea that an unbeliever who sets out to do things that are contrary to the will of God, they're going to bear the consequences of that. You don't break the law, it breaks you. And when we think about those who that I visit on a regular basis in the prison, some of them have, by one violent act, have essentially lost the freedom for the rest of their lives on earth. It is a very hard thing. And so, yes, Christians have difficult times. The Lord has promised to be with us in them. He's promised to turn it for our good. He's promised to teach us wonderful lessons, to purify our faith through this time of difficulty. But it's not hard in the same way that the way of the transgressor is hard, because that hardness, of course, is the rock on which their lives are ruined. It's destruction that's ahead for them. The way I learned this lesson, because I didn't see it around me as a child, but the way I learned it was when I was in third or fourth grade, I took quite ill. I was taken to the hospital and um, every hospital room was full. And so they put me out in the hallway. And as if that wasn't bad enough, they were all out of boys' pajamas. And so I ended up being given, if you can believe it, a set of girls' frilly pajamas with roses on them. It's enough to put me in the psych ward. Anyway, eventually they caught on and they gave me some decent pajamas. And they put me into a room with another fellow who was actually an adult. He was probably 19 years old. He was, I could see, severely damaged. And little by little, the story came out. He had been partying and got drunk. And he was walking home and he got tired of walking. And lo and behold, he saw a friend's motorcycle sitting by a restaurant and he decided to borrow it. Well, he headed off and not long until he tried to pass a vehicle, he misjudged distances. He careened into one, smashed his one knee and, and went flying off into a car coming the other way, ended up getting one leg completely amputated. The other knee was in terrible shape and lots of other damage. And then he discovered that actually his friend had sold his motorcycle. <laughs> it wasn't his at all. So he ended up being charged with stealing the motorcycle, riding without a helmet, riding without insurance, um, riding without a motorcycle license, the crossing uh, double line, driving while impaired, etc., etc., etc. I remember the day when the police came to take this fellow away. And to my little eyes, I mean, this was all new to me. I'd never seen such a thing. And to see this piling up of consequences to one foolish action. And for the first time in my life, 
this verse became very real to me. So when we think about the life of faith, yes, there are hard things. If we think it's hard here, try living as a Christian in Saudi Arabia or North Korea or China. I'm not saying that we don't have hard times, but we have the Lord with us. We have the Father watching over us, the Spirit indwelling us, the Savior interceding for us, the promises of God that are true for us, the guarantee that it's working for our good, and that the end of the path is glory. So the assumption that God wants to rob people of fun, that the guardrails that he puts in his word are actually there to rob us of enjoyment is totally false. They're there for our safety, for our protection. Why the scripture says that in his presence there is fullness of joy, and at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. And what does the scripture say in the story of the prodigal? They began to be merry. It's God's intention to have an everlasting celebration in the throne room of the universe, to invite us, to welcome us in to the table of the king and to enjoy forever everything he has provided. We ain't seen nothing yet, folks. And so uh, while it is true that weeping endures for the night, and there are many of God's people who struggle and suffer and have grave difficulty, it is not accidental. God only allows it because ultimately it is for our good. And we lay claim to that. And we realize that by obedience, by walking the life of faith, though it has its challenges, we're guaranteed that it's leading us home, that the path of the just is as a shining light that shines more and more to the perfect day. So Christian, pity the poor sinner. I remember my dad who he hated cigarette smoke. But he'd say to us when we were sitting in a restaurant in those days, there'd be people smoking cigarettes. And he would say, look, don't give them a hard time. It's the only pleasure they have. They have nothing to look forward to like we do. And so he didn't begrudge the sinners their little pleasures because he knew that it would only be a little time until there were no pleasures for them at all. But for us, it's all pleasure ahead. We were built for pleasure, and God designed us to enjoy that. That's true for every person. He wants us all to go out into the highways and byways and invite people to the banqueting house because he has more than enough, right? This is the idea of the prodigal story, the, the shepherd and the woman who finds her coin, and the father rejoice with me. There's too much joy for heaven. He wants to share it with earth. God help us to be happy Christians, even in the midst of difficulty, to, to be as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, because the way of the believer is not to destruction. Even the hard times are designed not to make us bitter, but to make us better. And God help us to realize that one of these days, the last tear will be wiped away, and we shall be in the presence of fullness of joy forever and ever.